questions, and I'm going to take you back to 101 level. Uh, and I probably won't try to. I probably won't try to uh, go into too deep detail on every single one of these, but I want to uh, more than anything make you aware of some of the resources that that we have available for you. And if you want to take a deeper dive. Uh, you can talk to me about some of these things and some of my, my coworkers for this. I do want to thank uh, everyone for inviting us to participate in this. We're one of several organizations in Texas participating in the Kids Well Grant here in Texas, so we're really happy to be able to be here today. And uh, the piece I was asked to, to focus on was on the health care issues for, for Texas kids. <laughs> And I'm also, I also brought in a few of our sort of general indicators from other folks at my office who aren't just healthcare people. So the first thing I wanted to show you was this is our Texas per capita. So this is per each of the 25, 26 million Texans where we rank on spending and how we compare to other states. And you can see that um, we are not in last place on everything. Uh, there's notably a few places um, where, we're, where we're somewhere in the middle. Our spending per Texan on K through 12 is 22nd, but you'll see a very different ranking when we look at spending per student because we have so many more kids than most states do proportionally as the previous presenters have pointed out to you. So you see a really different ranking when we get there. And of course, most of you are probably aware that uh, we have one of the highest uninsured rates in the country. We have the highest uninsured rate in the country for, for people of all ages. And you can see on our Medicaid, it says Medicaid and welfare. We essentially don't spend any money on welfare in Texas. We have almost no people left getting cash assistance in Texas. So almost all of that spending is strictly Medicaid. And even uh, you know, with our socioeconomic conditions, we're still 43rd in terms of how much we spend in Medicaid per Texan. Um, this is showing you, we have here a lot of angst about Medicaid in Texas, but when you actually go in and adjust for inflation, our spending per Medicaid client is actually, and particularly the state share of that, is actually considerably less than it was a decade ago. So, for example, in the most recent year, we were spending in 2013 dollars about uh, just over $3,000 per Medicaid client in state dollars compared to $3,500 per client back in 2001. So all of the increase in spending in Medicaid in Texas is because of having more uninsured people, uh, a growing number of people who qualify for the program, not because our spending per person is going up. Uh, similarly, uh, if you ingest for inflation, and this is in 2013 dollars, and this, these last two slides my brilliant colleague Eva DeLuna Castro did, uh, so I wouldn't want to take credit for him. I couldn't make them look as good or make the numbers right if I had to. So, but basically we're looking at a situation where our per student spending in, in inflation adjusted dollars is actually a little lower than it was back in 2002 as well. And then finally, this is where I said we get to these different rankings when you, instead of looking at how much you spend on education per person in Texas, we look at spending per student in Texas. And you can see that some of these northeastern states are, are tied for first place, essentially. And Texas is down here at 48th, according to these NEA rankings. Um, and then, an, again, another one of Eva's slides, just to sort of give you some context uh, more broadly about some of the indicators of need in Texas that uh, there we are, I believe that this is consistent with the earlier presenters, that we are the number two state in terms of children as a percentage of our population, um, the number one state in total residents without health insurance, 12th in child poverty, 6th in elderly poverty, uh, and these are all based on some of that same ACS data that previous presenters have used. Uh, and not fabulous looking educational outcomes either. The share of residents 25 or older with at least a diploma were last, uh, or at least maybe there's only one after us because this ranking may include DC. I'm never 100% sure whether they do. Um, and then just a couple of slides before I get to the healthcare stuff, just reminding us all that one of the things that we do annoyingly at our center is remind people that you've got to be paying attention to revenue systems and how adequate they are and, and how equitable they are, just like public school, uh, you've got to be paying attention to revenue if you want to be paying attention to the outcomes and the investments in state government. And some of the, these are just examples of all of the exemptions we have, which are kind of the, the passive, you don't have to ask for it money that, that people get. Uh, <laughs> 
in terms of exemptions from property taxes in Texas that are all represent money that comes you know, off the plate for public schools to access. And, you know, if we, we have to be willing to address these things uh, as we look at school finance and the adequacy of funding for your school children, and as you, you know, as you can imagine, none of them are easy to tackle. And finally, just uh, to put the whole school finance trend in perspective, just a reminder that, that part of what we did was uh, a, a number of years back, our legislature uh, rejiggered our school finance situation and said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to lower your school property taxes because you're all complaining about your local property taxes being too high and we're going to replace some of that with state revenue uh, so that your local property taxes won't have to carry as much of the burden. But what really happened was they didn't set up the finance system uh, strongly enough to generate as much revenue as they had taken out of the local plate. And so basically, all of these other things, as the graphic is trying to show you here, all of the other things that state government has to do is, are now being short funded because so much of that money is having to go in to fill what is at least a $10 billion hole every time they try to write a new state budget in Texas, all because of the restructuring of that school finance system. Um, so I'm going to just fly really quickly through some of these healthcare things so that we can get to, to your questions and discussion. I, I want to point out this is the latest. This is the census likes to keep us all confused. So they have two different surveys that look at health insurance, and this is the current population survey uh, is the one that has been going back for several decades. So we often use it because it has that long trend data. Uh, and basically, uh, according, according to the most recent uh, census data from ACS. We have about 6.4 million uninsured Texans in 2012, and that was one in four, basically, of Texans of all ages. But kids are only half as likely to be uninsured as adults in Texas. So we have about 1.2 million of that 6.4 million, million uninsured are under the age of 19, and they are only half as likely to be uninsured. Their uninsured rate is about 16.4%. For working age adults, almost twice as many, or 32%, are uninsured. So our big challenge moving forward, particularly with health reform, is our working age adults. But obviously, that's still an awful lot of uninsured children. And the entire reason why the children's rate is so much lower is Medicaid and CHIP. So basically, Poor and moderate income children in Texas have access to Medicaid and CHIP when they don't get coverage through their parents' work, but adults do not, essentially, and that's part of the challenge we're dealing with as we deal with the ACA Medicaid expansion question. So we have actually had a significant decline in the uninsured rate for children when I first started working. Uh, when Congress first authorized the creation of that CHIP program, one in four Texas kids were uninsured. So the kids' uninsured rate has dropped by a full eight percentage points from what it was before we launched CHIP and before we made Medicaid a much friendlier program for parents to keep their children in. So uh, in 2000, we had about 2.1, I'm sorry, in, in 2000, we had just under a million kids enrolled in Texas Medicaid. And since then, with the growth in children's Medicaid and the creation of the CHIP program, today we're covering 3.1 million children uh, out of both of those programs. Uh, and like I said, the, un the uninsured rate has dropped from 25% to 16%. And then when you look at the lower income kids in the CHIP and Medicaid pool, that's under two times the poverty level, uh, their uninsurance ra uninsured rate has dropped from 35% before CHIP to 21.4% in the most recent data. So let's drill into who our uninsured kids are and look at it by ethnicity. Uh, and uh, and I, it's been a long time since I've done this pie chart. So I, you know, it was sort of eye-opening to me to, to put the 1.2 million kids up there and see that, that almost 70% of them, or 830,000 roughly, are Hispanic children in Texas. Uh, and then you could see non-Hispanic white children, African-American children, Asian-American kids, and then a tiny slice of uh, other kinds of identified folks showing up. So obviously, uh, this is not a surprise to anybody who works in healthcare in Texas. Uh, when we're talking about access to healthcare for uh, Texas children, the the Hispanic child population is is you know facing more of a challenge uh, than uh, than our other ethnic groups essentially. Um, 
This is a picture of who had Medicaid in January of 2013. I haven't gotten an updated version of this detailed file for a while, but it hasn't changed very much. These numbers have crept up by a few tens of thousands probably in several categories. But basically, one of the things I have to educate Texans about a lot is the fact that Texas Medicaid is, is mostly children and that very, very few adults get Medicaid in Texas. And so who are the adults who get Medicaid in Texas? We've got significant populations of fully disabled adults below poverty, elderly folks over 65 who are below poverty who typically get both Medicare and Medicaid, so Medicaid picks up the out-of-pocket cost of Medicare for them. And then you have two tiny groups of poor parents. Uh, today, it's probably, this month is probably somewhere around 225,000 parents total. So on the one hand, I've got 2.6 million children getting Medicaid but only around 200,000 of their parents qualify. And then the maternity coverage in Medicaid is absolutely a critical piece of the program. Somewhere around 56% of Texas births are paid for by Texas Medicaid, 56% of Texas births. And that's, we are on the high end, but in every state, the, the range across the states in the country is, the low end might be around 44%. So every state Medicaid pays a huge role in paying for prenatal care and deliveries in Texas, we are definitely on the high end for that. But that coverage, you don't get a card until you have a positive pregnancy test and your card doesn't work, uh, stops working two months after the baby's born. So it's only temporary coverage. So we don't have very many adults getting Medicaid in Texas. Um, comparing, this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation and basically they are just, just showing that uh, the, uh, the black doesn't, for some reason they didn't put that in their legend, but black is uninsured and you can just see that uh, Hispanics in Texas have an even higher uninsured rate than they do nationally. So, uh, so co you know, coverage issues are really important for Texas Hispanics. And then we compare the dynamics of this Medicaid expansion decision and the, the roughly half the states still have not made that decision to expand Medicaid to adults under the Affordable Care Act in Texas is one of them. And in the United States of the adults, the uninsured adults who stand to be affected by that Medicaid expansion, they are just over a third Hispanic, but in Texas they are almost two thirds Hispanic, the adults that we're, we're looking at. So this is a, another way of showing you, this is what the coverage scheme was supposed to look like under the Affordable Care Act as Congress passed it in 2010. And the problem we have here, so we're still gonna have Medicaid and CHIP for our kids. Everybody who has affordable, minimally decent job-based coverage is expected to keep it, but the people who don't have access to that gain sliding scale access to premium assistance and then if they are above four times the poverty level, which is a little over 94,000 for a family of four this year, they, and they don't have access to that job-based coverage, they can still buy coverage in the new marketplace, they're just not gonna get a subsidy for it. So the problem we're left with is that when Congress wrote this bill, they made the sliding scale access to help in the new marketplace start at the poverty line. So when Texas decided, and 24 other states decided not to expand Medicaid, they are basically leaving all of these adults below the poverty line without a coverage option in 2014. So this is where we stand today. Uh, and I will show you a couple of more things about it. So our former state demographer, uh, who's probably lived in every city in, in, the, in Texas now, but currently located in Houston, used to be here in San Antonio, uh, Steve Murdoch and Michael Klein at Rice did this analysis of the ACA's coverage expansions for Texas. And basically the takeaway is they said with, with just moderate enrollment under the ACA, we would cut the uninsured population in half in Texas. But unfortunately, they did this analysis before the Supreme Court decision. So they were not teeing it up for this Medicaid expansion decision at all, but they basically concluded that the Medicaid piece of it accounts for half the gain. So we leave half the coverage gains of the ACA on the table if we don't do Medicaid expansion in Texas is the concern here. And I'm not gonna go through all these numbers, but I wanna make you aware that uh, our own Medicaid agency has estimated that if we were starting Medicaid expansion in January, there would be uh, more than $6 billion a year in additional net federal uh, healthcare funding flowing through the Texas economy every year from 2014 to 2017. And then we can take the commission's numbers and distribute it by their own data on how Medicaid spending 
Medicaid spending in Texas is distributed in Texas counties, and we see that, for example, Harris County, which is, of course, the biggest county, would be getting nearly a billion dollars every year in additional health care spending uh, if we did the Medicaid expansion. You can see some of these other large cities and counties. And here's the South Texas, so you can see Bayer County, where we are today, over half a billion dollars a year in additional revenue. And then look at these counties in the valley. This is, I think, one of the things that <laughs> gets my blood pressure up the most is that the economic development potential for the Rio Grande Valley would be so huge if we did this Medicaid expansion down there. It would create uh, people like Ray Perryman and like <coughs> Billy Hamilton, our former state deputy controller and chief revenue estimator, have separately in separate studies estimated anywhere from, from 300,000 to a half a million jobs would be created by this income flow of $6 billion a year. And, and again, the Valley would, would definitely uh, benefit from that. So we are not the Lone Ranger. As I said, we are not the only state. All of these pale blue states are states that have not done the Medicaid expansion, except this was September 30th, and Ohio has made the move since then. So we got one more state. Pennsylvania is close. They might be moving soon. Um, and basically, this is where we are left, uh, that in January, a mom with two kids living on $18,000 in Texas won't have any help to get health care coverage, but her neighbor with two kids who's earning $20,000 will. She'll get such a generous subsidy that she can get full coverage on a sliding scale for less than $33 a month, possibly even less than that. That was a, that was a you know, high-end figure. Uh, another way to look at it is the $18,000 mom in La Mesa is going to get is not going to have any coverage in January, but her cousin over in Hobbs, New Mexico, will because they've done the Medicaid expansion. So I just want to make you aware that you know one of the reasons I'm here is under this Kids Well grant. I'm working with a lot of different Texas organizations, and we have uh, and there we have many partners, both formally and informally, who are all trying to move this Medicaid dis expansion discussion forward uh, and to 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 just do what we can to make sure that working poor adults in Texas do have coverage options as soon as we possibly can. And I'll point you out that you can find all these links to these on our website. Cover Texas Now is our coalition. Texas Well and Healthy is our campaign that all of our partners participate in and where we've created a new uh, website where people who are in that coverage gap can get some more information and also can get involved called texasleftmeout.org. We haven't done a big media push on the latter one there, but we want to make sure that there's a place where people uh, who are in that situation can get more information since people are signing up right now. So I think that was all that I had, and I'll turn it back over to Juan. Thank you. Yep.